to be honest, I'm really not feeling that great. So yeah, I hate doing response shows, but this is kind of the easy cop out of something that I want to do and want to put out there anyway, because something got dropped into the public consciousness in the past couple of weeks. Yeah, this is my surprise face. I am a fan of the show Extra Credits. If you watch my stuff, you really should watch theirs, but they do it much better. One of their episodes was talking about sexual harassment in the gaming community, citing an incident from a few months ago on a gaming reality TV show. Gaming reality television. I guess it's kind of like Big Brother meets Big Bang Theory. It was meant to be hype for the Capcom Street Fighter vs. Tekken game, but the show turned into something more. One of the players, a guy named Eris, began needling and, for all intents and purposes, sexually harassing a female member of his team. Miranda, you want to come over here? What's the matter, girl? Why are you pouty? What's the problem? How are your thies? Are they okay? Your thighs okay? All right, good. What kind of player is messing me up? Hey, you need to be able to focus when people are heckling you. That's fine, but like... <laughs> You need to be able to play when people are harassing you. Thanks for that, Harris. Take off your shirt. By day five of the live broadcast event, he defended himself on the live stream. Can I get my Street Fighter without sexual harassment? You can't. You can't. They're one and the same thing. This is a community that's uh, like, you know, 15 or 20 years old. And the, the sexual harassment is part of a culture. And if you remove that from the fighting game community, it's not the fighting game community. It's... Starcraft, and that's what you're trying to do to the fighting game community, and it's not right. It's ethically wrong. When I go to Starcraft right now, I see a Phoenix stage getting blown up, and there's some dude in the audience just yelling, bitch, bitch, like every time she gets hit, and then she gets killed, and he goes, bitch, rip that bitch. Yeah, that's totally acceptable. Really? Really? You're going to tell me that's acceptable? I never said it was acceptable. Look, man, what is unacceptable about that? There's nothing unacceptable about that. These are people. We're in America, man. This isn't North Korea. We can say what we want. Wow, dude. Just, just wow. You know, part of me wants to go off on this guy, but the thing is that it's been overplayed hundreds of times by now. I mean, the blogosphere absolutely exploded with this, this guy said. But there's one other thing that he said that a lot of people tended to overlook. The, the beauty of the fighting game community, and you, you should know this, is that it's based around not being welcomed. That is the beauty of it. That is the, the key essence of it. When you walk into an arcade for the first time, nobody likes you. And it's in that blunt moment of honesty that we find the topic of our show. The sexual harassment is just one tool in the arsenal. If someone really soft and nice, but you wouldn't want that. You like something hard and thick, right, Shane? And in addition to all this gay stuff, Racist stuff! Imagine I said a lot of racist shit and it's in your brain right now. N-word! So the question is why? Where did this culture come from and why is it still here? Okay, first things first. I'm trying to avoid stereotypes, but I maintain they all come from somewhere. What I find interesting is that Eris is talking about arcade culture. When you walk into an arcade for the first time, nobody likes you. I used to be an arcade junkie back in the day of real arcades, when games cost 25 cents a try and tokens were gold. And for the most part, it was a guys club. Or I guess more correctly, a boys club with some older creepy dudes playing the hell out of Street Fighter and the like. But one thing that I don't remember from the old arcades, and that is trash talking, at least not to the level of what these guys are talking about. Okay, granted, if it was a friend of yours, you'd give him a little bit of grief if you happen to beat him in a game, but that was it. I mean, it's just kind of friendly. It wasn't at the vicious level what these guys are talking about here. So where did this level of trash talk ever come from? As much as I like to go all the way back to Leonidas when I talk about stuff like this, let's stick to modern history. Some have argued that trash talking is the complete antithesis of sportsmanship, but it serves a little more of a devious purpose. It dehumanizes your opponent. Why do you think people happily spout racist slurs during wartime? Hey, uh, here's yours, bull eggs. Here, one for you, monkey face. And don't shop, there's plenty for all. Here you are, slain eyes. Everybody gets one. I'll bet that made your skin crawl, but at the time, that was accepted. And pretty much expected, too. But that's what this kind of behavior kind of tends to do. You don't look at your opponent as a human being with a family and things and places and stuff. You look at them as, well, insert dirty slur here. So this brings me to Eris. Was he stereotyping like this? Was he just looking at his opponents as stereotypes rather than as people in order to help him game better? 
I was exactly the way everyone expected me to be. I did everything that everyone expected me to do um, when I was asked to be on the show. But the people that were involved did not expect for the outcome to be the way that it was. As soon as they started, I started trying to manipulate the whole thing and trying to get the advantage in some way and, like, you know, alter it in some way, like, via technicalities in the way things are written. So that's kind of how it's been going the whole time. And the Superman thing is also related to that type of thing. I don't hate anybody. Uh, I, I, in fact, I'm a very friendly guy. The people that know me well know that. Yes, I will. And, you know, I just like to, you know, I mean, I am, I am a dick. But <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not that much of a dick. You know, I'm, I'm just a, I'm a little dick. Not a big dick. <laughs> that's fine. I find this an interesting concept here, then that he's saying after the fact that what he was doing was just playing the opponents. I don't buy this entirely. On one hand, it's saying that the ends justify the means, which makes a whole new monologue out of this. But on the other, this was all said after the fact, and after he realized he could not deny what he had said. Uh, but then again... I don't know what that means, but I'm in love. I'm in... Will, will you marry me? Do you marry me? You marry me. Yes. Yes? I have no money. No money. Yeah. So you're going to have to support me. I'll be a stay-at-home dad. <laughs> yeah. This is not abnormal. In fact, many in the fighting game community spoke out and supported this guy, basically stating that his behavior was the norm and that we should get used to it. Why? And I kind of mean this question too. Why should I accept it? Just because everyone else does it, that makes it right? Okay, before I get preachy, let's dial it back a little bit. What I really think this goes back to is something that I've said before. They don't want you here. The, the beauty of the fighting game community, and you, you should know this, is that it's based around not being welcomed. I will play the hell out of that clip because it's the culture defined in one raw, honest moment. A lot of gamer culture seems to be how long can you endure the crap that people are going to give you. It's a virtual hazing, if you will. Now couple that with this. This creates safety. This creates anonymity. This is a very visible wall between you and people that you're interacting with. And this is what creates a lot of the problem because, well, there's no accountability for whatever you do in the virtual world to your real world self. And on the very rare occasion that there might be some accountability for Okay, I wasn't going to bring this up, but it is relevant. In 2012, EVE Online FanFest had a panel of Alliance leaders. The speaker here is Alex Gitana. Gitana, uh, he goes by the nickname Mitani in EVE Online. He even admits that he was drunk during his part of the presentation. I, I suppose I'm not drunk enough. No, you're not. I can hear your words clearly. <laughs> Well, he was bragging about how his friend trolled a player in World and how that player said he was suicidal and depressed and all that. And then, then Alex did this. Uh, it, incidentally, if you want to make the guy kill himself, his name is... So that's the bad answer to the corp? question. Find him. The resulting fallout led to Alex resigning, but not until after he was banned by CCP for a month, and allegedly Alex gave all his in-game money to the guy and all that, but I don't believe that. In a virtual universe where nothing is real, I am jaded enough to actually believe that this guy's regret is not real either. I mean, let's face it, had he not said that stuff publicly, CCP wouldn't have done a damn thing about it. If he would have gotten all of his alliance buddies to go troll this guy and try to convince the guy to go kill himself, pretty much business as usual. And when you look at the thread on the CCP forums that this guy was announcing his retirement, most of the people are supportive of him and trying to make him out to look like the victim. And I just gotta ask why? In his mind, and apparently in the mind of most of the replies, this is acceptable behavior. You get some power, create a cult of personality in a small virtual space, and then you use that power to pick on those weaker than you who you decide you just don't want around. You have no idea how hard this is being to steer clear of stereotypes and cliches, but oh hell, it's tempting. It would be really easy to write all of this off as just social rejects doing unto others what they've had done unto them. But I want to think there's more to it than that. 
CCP, for their part in the Fallout, they claim on their website that they do not condone the harassment of other players, but it's fairly common knowledge that MMO companies do little if nothing to enforce their policies. And let me show this again. It's the common feeling that it doesn't matter what you do. The company makes its money, and somehow if you manage to get banned by doing something really stupid, just make a new account. Lol. Here's where things get a little bit complicated. Eris made these comments on a show being sponsored by a large corporation. Large corporations have lots of money, lots of resources, and they're willing to put them all behind gaming if they can see a good deal coming to them from it. But the thing is, they don't just want to throw money at a project, they actually expect something in return. But one thing I've noticed about gamer culture is that they're very selfish. They just want everything for me, 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 it's all about me. Actually, kind of reminds me of another sport I've been involved with for a lot of my life. When I started snowboarding in the late 80s, most hills... Uh, what? <sighs> Nothing. Never mind. Okay, um, right, uh, snowboarding. When I started snowboarding, most hills wouldn't allow snowboards. They actually cited a lot of things, but it ended up that they just didn't like the attitude of most riders. The perception was that snowboarders were antisocial, foul mouth skater punks on snow with little to no respect for other people or places. You know, snowboarding is one of the unique things that Birth and Pass does, which, you know, which helps out, which, which makes business good, and uh, I think it's a neat spot to do it. It took almost 20 years, but through the efforts of riders to understand the value of social acceptance and the benefits that it brings, now we can pretty much go riding anywhere. Okay, almost anywhere. My point is that I see gaming today in much the same way I saw snowboarding back in the 1990s. In fact, a lot of the arguments you guys are making are the same thing that I heard back in the 1990s from snowboarding. Oh, these big corporations are going to come in, they're going to they're going to sterilize everything. They're going to they're going to take away our cultural identity. It's not going to be the same thing. That's probably why he's poking so much fun at StarCraft, because StarCraft is seen as the pro-gaming circuit side of things. No, I actually see his reaction as being more of abject fear and terror, you know, not wanting to change, not wanting to do something for the greater good, but you'd rather just drive these people off, you know, scare them away, keep them away from my thing. Which actually makes sense in the culture as it is now. It's about exclusion of all things new and staying comfortable in what you already know and have. Insulate yourself from new people and things because you don't know who's going to try to hurt you and make a preemptive strike against them. And if someone isn't in your clique, do everything you can to discourage them. You know, racism, sexist remarks, even just you mad bro or simple trolling is all part of it. Make them want to leave you alone first. Unfortunately, this also turns away many opportunities to make your hobby even more awesome. The best part is that you don't have to lose your cultural identity for this. Snowboarders can still do urban street riding and have just as much credibility as the half-pipe pretty boys. A culture of us only stagnates and dies on the vine, and gaming, well, they seem very content to want to be left alone. Hateful for what the world did to them or just scared of their own shadows, either stereotype works for large companies looking in. There's one other possibility that does need to be addressed, however, and that is that all gamers are just dicks. I don't buy into that though because I know that's not the case. I've met way too many cool people through forums, through the games themselves, through other interactive media who are really cool people so I can't just make a blanket statement like that because I know it's not true. Now I think the truth is a little bit more complicated but to kind of boil it down I think it really comes down to the uh, boys only club basically. It's a place where these guys can go and do what they want and say what they want and no one's ever going to hold them accountable for anything that they do which is a very juvenile and nearsighted way to live life, if you ask me. Look, I normally I would have some uplifting way to end this, but I really don't. Not this time. I just, I don't got it. I'm just one guy. I, I can't make the entire culture want to change. And this culture seems to know what's best for itself. <laughs>